Hello again. Well, um, as we were mentioning, 1970 was a very key and important year during my stay in Brazil. I, first of all, we had the buyout of Time Life. The Brazilian partner, Roberto Marinho, brought out Time Life's interests. And as I mentioned previously, he had asked me to stay on with him. And uh, I agreed to stay there and uh, remain in Brazil. And Time Life said goodbye. Uh, and he was very good. He, he had made it well worthwhile for me, uh, buying me an apartment, buying us, that is my family and I, an apartment in Ipanema, right near the beach in Rio, which was, which was very nice. And so um, that was the important thing. Then during that same period, in order, I was made executive superintendent of the network. But in order to do that, I had to become a Brazilian citizen and renounce my American citizenship. That was according to the Constitution in Brazil, which only allowed someone who was a natural born citizen to have anything to do with media. But they were willing to accept me as a naturalized citizen. So I went into the American consulate and renounced my American citizenship. And uh, the people in the consulate knew me since I was the only American there in the media. And uh, people at the CIA, this key CIA man who I knew there, he said to me, Joe, you don't have to worry. If anything happens that you get in any trouble here, you'll be able to come back to the U.S. right away. He assured me of that. Because as we mentioned, we were living under a military dictatorship there. And the dictatorship was getting stronger and stronger and demanding more things in the way of censorship and the things that we did there. So I becoming a citizen was a big step for me uh, in Brazil. Then the year started with, the year later on started with a few of us, Walter Clark and Jose Otavio and myself made a trip Broad, we were invited by f countries, various televisions in Japan, Russia, Germany, and England to visit television networks there. So that was quite an exciting experience. We uh, went to Tokyo first, and uh, it was very interesting to see how they were the first ones to develop a video cassette machine, and uh, that was a uh, that that in itself was was very unusual for us. Uh, from Japan, we we flew to Russia to Moscow on Aeroflot, which was a very um, very tricky airplane. It wasn't very well up to date. Sitting in front of us were some Cuban refugees. Cuba was very communist at the time, and they were singing songs of Cuba as we headed towards Moscow. Moscow was rather difficult for us because everything we did in Moscow, we were constantly watched and surveyed by people. We had guides with us, and of course, um, they, we had a driver and a guide, took us around, 
and of course we both spoke with them in Portuguese. Um, but they they understood everything that we said, including the driver, who was not had nothing to say, but laughed at my Brazilian friend's jokes in Portuguese whenever they came out. From there we went over to Germany and uh, from Radio Hamburg, they took us all around the country and showed us their new developments. And uh, we visited Stuttgart, Nuremberg, Munich, all of the major cities there. And from there we went to London, and there we were guests of BBC. And it was very unusual. We stood there at the uh, Hotel Savoy. Um, I think that was the name of it. It was the classiest hotel. And there we were, the three of us. And at that time, we there, somebody had arranged for us to go out on some dates with certain uh, uh, people, certain dates they arranged with us. So we hired a great big London bus, picked, picked us up at the hotel and took us to pick up our dates. And then we went out nightclub and had a wonderful time. So that was an enjoyable stay in London. And then back we came to work. Um, 1971 was the first year that we broke even working. It was a difficult year, but we did it. And 1972 was the year that we made our first profit. Um, in 1972, my wife and I, my ex-wife and I, separated after 26 years of marriage. Uh, neither one of us was very happy in our marriage for quite a while, and we were subsequently uh, divorced. Prior to our divorce in 1971, my youngest daughter, Olenka, uh, moved up to the States in high school. She couldn't stand living in Brazil. She moved up to complete high school in Los Angeles. And there was a year where my son was at UCLA and my older daughter, Laurie, who had been at Sarah Lawrence College in the East, took one year at UCLA. So all three children were here in Los Angeles sharing an apartment together. And uh, that was a happy time of their life, um, but not too happy a time for, for us. Um, 1972, it uh, turned out to be the first year that we made a profit. And uh, from then on, during the 1970s, the country, Brazil, grew in population. Because at that time, there wasn't much birth control. The average family had four to five children. And so the population grew but at the same time, even under the military dictatorship, the, uh, the, num the uh, economy was moving along quite nicely. The number of television sets in the country increased, and consequently the market, the advertising market increased, and our network grew substantially to where uh, we became number one and we spread our programming throughout the country and began having affiliate stations in all of the major cities uh, in Brazil. By 1980, we had 31 different cities around the country that were affiliated uh, to our network. 
So the television network prospered uh, considerably and we had our fights with the military, but they seemed to uh, be less and less as time went on. Um, in 1978, I thought that I wanted to retire and leave the work there and go back to the States. I sent a letter to Roberto Marino requesting that, and he refused to let me go. He said, no, you can't leave now. And so I stayed, and I did stay with him until 1980. I wrote him a letter, and I said, I'm giving you six months' notice, but I intend to go back to the States. And the reason, he couldn't understand why I was leaving. And the reason that I, I decided to retire for several reasons at that time. I, by that time, was in charge of some 8,000 employees, actors, directors, writers, journalists, engineers, all sorts of P actors who worked for us. And I was chained to my office and my desk, having meetings constantly, trying to control things. I had 30 major executives under me, but it was very hard work. And at that time, I, I felt that I had enough of it, and there were a few things I wanted to do. I felt I certainly had enough money to retire. I felt that I didn't want to work anymore that I wanted to at that age of 56. I wanted to study more about the meaning of, my, of life generally, about what was life all about, why are we here. And also I wanted to go back to the States and be a mentor to my children who had all moved back to the States. And at that time, one of them was married to a Brazilian. Well, Mourinho couldn't understand that, but that's the reason I left. Well, I never discovered the meaning of life, and I wasn't a mentor, a good mentor, to my children. But that's what I did in 1980. I retired and went back and stayed in Marin County at the home of my daughter. I neglected to mention that after we divorced in 1974, I bought a home for my children where they could all be together, a nice redwood house in, in the redwoods in Marin County, the little town of Novato. So when I retired, I was going to build another little house next to my daughter, who at that time was married and living in the house. They were the only ones living in the house. They had uh, goats and horses and dogs, and uh, they were starting their life there. But um, as I started to build a house there, they separated, and so I thought, that's not too good. I moved down to Los Angeles and lived in a condo that I had had here before. I moved down and settled here in that period of time. In 1981, 1982, I started to have trouble with my larynx and I had something called leukoplakia. And every now there were things growing on my vocal cords. And so I went to UCLA and they would 
scrape off my vocal cords, did not find any malignancy, but then the growth would grow back. And I, during two years, I had about four different um, procedures done on my vocal cords, on my larynx. And my voice was getting quite, quite difficult. Um, that was from 19, until about 1983. Finally in 1983, I got to a surgeon in Boston who using laser treatment, which was pretty new at the time, was able to perform surgery on my larynx. And I recovered my voice. And he, uh, then I had to come back to Los Angeles, had radiation and uh, so I recovered from that pretty well. Uh, then uh, about that time, I was, I'd keep going back and forth to Brazil, both for personal reasons and to help them out with leftover things from when I had been in charge of the network. Um, also, there was a think tank out of Washington called the American Enterprise Institute, which asked me to go along with them on a trip to Japan, um, where they were doing a study um, of the of Japanese businessmen and of the Japanese government, because Japan was advancing very rapidly. We went there, and that was quite an experience, visiting many of the major cities there, and uh, actually one experience interesting while I was there in Nagoya, in the Toyota Automobile Factory. We had this huge meeting of about 40 Japanese people, mainly men, around a big square table. And there was an earthquake took place while we were at the meeting. And uh, it stunned the few of our Americans who were there. But the Japanese didn't seem to bother at all. They just kept going. And the meeting went on. And the earthquake ended. That was a, quite an interesting experience. That occurred in 1984 to be exact. Meantime, I had been in Los Angeles during these years studying astronomy, philosophy, various things to help me understand a little more about what life was all about. But during that time, uh, I was contacted by some people who had owned a channel here in Los Angeles. Channel 52 was owned by Oak Industries, who had used it for a form of pay television. But with the advent of cable, they had abandoned the station, and the station was for sale. It was Channel 52. Um, the people at Oak knew me, and I looked at it, and I, I decided that I thought it would be very interesting to try to get that channel and make it into a Spanish language channel. Um, Oak gave me an option on it, and. Uh, to buy it from them for a large sum of $30 million. Um, and so I went around looking for someone to buy it, finally found a partner, Back East Reliance Insurance Company, who agreed to go into partnership with me. And we started, which was 
the local Spanish television station called Quevea. The, the majority owner was Reliance Insurance Company. And I, of course, had a small part of it. We started from pieces of paper. I had to arrange. There was only one television station here in Spanish. It was owned by um, Televisa in Mexico. And it wasn't serving the Mexican community too well. The only thing they were doing was passing their programming from Mexico directly to Los Angeles. There were about, oh, almost three million Hispanic people living here in Los Angeles at that time. And so I decided to do that largely to help the Hispanic community in Los Angeles who were being underserved. Well, we worked at it. I was able to get some people who had operated a part-time television station on Channel 18 to come to work with me. And I had gotten a few Brazilians to come up here and work with me. And we went on the air in November of 1985. And we bought programming from different countries throughout Latin America. And we did produce our own news and local affairs programming. And that was my knowledge was programming was quite good at that time. I was running the station and I, I was the general manager, but I couldn't be made the name of general manager. I couldn't be made name director, that is, because I was not an American citizen. I was a Brazilian citizen who was here in the U.S on a green card. And so I was named general manager and we had to name someone else as general director. Well, in six months, we had gotten our ratings up to where we were getting 40% of the market away from the one television station that was here in Los Angeles, Televisa. In the meantime, the local congressman, Congressman Roy Ball, who was in close touch with me there, said, look, Joe, you say you renounced your American citizenship. Let's check this out and make sure that that's the case. He sent through wires to the State Department and they checked through and there was no record in Washington in the State Department that I had ever renounced my American citizenship. So Congressman Roy Ball said, well, Joe, you're an American citizen. I want you to go down to the, the um, passport division and just get your American passport. Do that and you'll be all set. Well, I did that. I went down and I started to fill out the form to get my passport. And one of the questions on it was, have you ever renounced your American citizenship or had done anything against the American government? Well, I could not falsely answer that question. I had to answer 
that I had renounced it. And with that, I could not get my American citizenship at that time. I had to wait until I'd been li living here, been on my green card for five years before I could apply for an American, to become an American citizen. So there I was running it as a manager, but not as director because the U.S. law required you to be an American citizen if you were to be a director of a television station in the United States. We proceeded very well at Kevea, the Glendale station, so well that my partners back east, Reliance Insurance Company, got so excited at the thought that they said they wanted to buy up other stations around the country and to create a network. They went to John Blair and Company, who had owned some English language stations in various cities, as well as in Puerto Rico, they owned a station called Telemundo down there. And they went and bought all of these various cities, New York, Miami, uh, Chicago, etc., for $280 million. But that money was all borrowed. They did not have it. At that time, there was a great deal of leveraging going on in this country. And they had leveraged it with Mike Milken and his company. Well, I was a small owner of the, of the stations that were purchased, but I looked at the debt and I looked at what we had uh, to, to pay back. My thought was not to buy stations. I wanted to make the Los Angeles station a super station and then get affiliates around the country who would be working with us. And that way we would not have to have borrowed the money. So we had quite, quite an argument over that. But since they were the majority owner at the time, I had to go along with them. And so for a period of time, I was running these stations and we decided on the name that we should give the network. Now that we had about six stations, we decided that we would call it Telemundo. And that was done in my office in Glendale that we created the name of the network. And so it began and we started to operate it. We operated it at the beginning, the new network. It was difficult doing so, um, but we did that as much as we can, we could. But then the argument between, arguments between myself and the majority owner over the manner in which we had purchased the stations and the debt, which I felt we could not even pay the interest on the debt, caused me to decide to leave Telemundo. That was after two years of operation under the name Telemundo. So it was in 1987 that I left Telemundo. By then, Telemundo had gone on the New York Stock Exchange and we were a public company. Um, I was given, at the time, as I said, I was still green card and I could not be the uh, chairman, but I was given a letter 
saying that as soon as I got my citizenship, I would become chairman of Telemundo. Well, I left shortly before I was able to get my citizenship. So that ended my stint at Telemundo, which became very successful and grew, as we all know. Telemundo, as I say, was originally majority owned by Reliance Insurance Company. They continued running Telemundo for a while, but then found that they were unable to pay any of the debt. And subsequently, Reliance and Telemundo went into bankruptcy. They were bought out of bankruptcy by, see, that is the shareholders were bought out of bankruptcy by, eventually by Sony Pictures and Liberty Media who bought the, the uh, shareholders out of bankruptcy. And then they went, ran Telemundo unsuccessfully for another year or two, and then eventually sold Telemundo to NBC for $2.7 billion. So that was the end of the Telemundo story. Um, after I was, after I had uh, left Telemundo, I was called by Roberto Marinho from Brazil. TV Globo had entered into a partnership in Italy and had purchased a television channel, a television network in Italy called Telemonte Carlo. Globo asked me if I would be willing to do some consulting for them in Italy with Telemonte Carlo, which was being run by some of their Brazilian executives. I agreed to do that, and from 19, uh, 1987, late 87, until 1990, that's what I did. I would go back and forth doing consulting at times for a month at a month at a time, then come back to Los Angeles. During that period, my parents were here living with me. My mother passed away. Um, my children were here and we lived together. Uh, while at TV Globo in 1997, as I mentioned, we were living under a military dictatorship. And the military wanted to know who was in charge of the network and who would run it in the event that Roberto Marino, who was then in his late 70s would pass away. And so our director in Brasilia arranged a dinner at which all of the top military generals of the country were going to attend. And of course, Roberto Marino had his two sons had Walter Clark, who was my partner. He was the natural-born Brazilian who was general director of the network, I being the executive superintendent. So we were to have a dinner at the director of the Brasilia, which is the capital of Brazil, have a dinner at his house. We got to Brasilia earlier in the day to visit our station there. And we had lunch at the station. Walter Clark, 
who was a wonderful, charismatic, intelligent, talented man, was drank a great deal. He was really an alcoholic. And I, through the years together, had tried to protect him from his alcoholism. Well, on this particular day, we uh, were at this lunch and Walter started to drink quite heavily. And after the lunch, he was quite drunk. So I had to take him back to the hotel and have him go to bed, hopefully hoping that he would be well by the time of our dinner that night at, at our director's house. Well, the dinner was to take place at nine o'clock at night. And so I went to fetch Walter at his hotel room and he woke him up. His eyes were red and he was not altogether with it. But he, I said, I think Walter, you should not go to this dinner. But he said, no, Joe, I'll be fine. I can make it, I'll be fine. So I took him to the dinner at our director's house. We, we were all out in the garden. The generals were there with their wives. Roberto Marino was there with his wife. And I, I shepherded Walter over in the garden to the chairs of one of the young men of the government who was there at a distance away from the generals. Well, of course there were people serving drinks and they ordered a drink for him as well as a drink for the others. And we were chatting quite peacefully until the chap who was there, the government chap said to the waiter, look, we're having drinks here. Why don't you leave, leave a bottle of scotch right here instead of just coming around for a drink at a time? Well, that did it. Walter started to have another drink or two, became completely drunk, and he walked over to the generals and began saying things to some of them that was not very commendable. Uh, telling one of the generals how he had stood up for him in spite of the bad things that they had been doing and some other uh, very uh, uncomfortable remarks, even, even telling the director, our director there, that he was being nice to the wives of the generals, only uh, trying to uh, kiss up to the generals. Um, and so he got so drunk that it became very, very uncomfortable for Roberto Marino because we were there to show the generals that we, under Walter's leadership, would be taking over if anything happened to Roberto Marino. So we had to take him, put him in a car, send him back to the hotel, and the dinner continued without his presence. The next day, we went back to Rio. I was on the plane with Roberto Marino came back to his office and he said to me, Joe, we've got to let Walter Clark go. We've got to let him go. We can't keep him here any longer. And uh, I couldn't anything but agree with him. 
But nobody could find Walter. The next day, he had disappeared from Brasilia and had taken a flight to Paris to receive an award which was given to him in the name of our television station by some French organization. So Walter was not to be found. And uh, finally, he appeared in New York a few days later. And the uh, Roberto Marino wanted me to tell him that he was released. And I said, I'm not going to do it. You're the boss. You're the one who hired him. You've got to do it. So he finally got one of our other journalists to write a letter of resignation to be applied to him. While in New York, Walter called me. He was in New York, and he was semi-drunk at the time. And he said, Joe, I'm sure I'm going to be let go, but I want to make sure that I'm given a good severance pay. If not, I'll commit suicide. Will you please take care of that for me? And so I went to Roberto Marino, and I arranged a very good severance pay for Walter, who had been making over a million dollars a year uh, to arrange a severance for him. And that was that. Then in 1988, on September 23rd, while I was back here, I met Doreen, Doreen Stauber, who was to become my wonderful wife. So we started to go together in, 19, in 1988. We were subsequently married in 1990, May 1990. But during that period of time, uh, Doreen accompanied me on our trips to Italy, working, having fun in Italy. It was great doing that kind of work. Uh, consulting in Italy was really a kick, and many wonderful things happened, including getting to know most of Italy while we were there. And that's what we did until 1990. And uh, we got married in 1990, and uh, then we started a great deal of traveling. In, um, in 1991, uh, we were in Brazil. We had gone back and forth uh, frequently to Brazil and Italy and the United States. We were constantly on the move. In Brazil, there was no paid television and uh, the thought occurred to me that it would be a good idea to try to start it. Um, so I, I went to Roberto Marino, and uh, after, I, after I had secured authorization from Brasilia to do so, and he agreed to go into partnership with our head production man. And so we started Globosat, which was a satellite television, um, pay television via satellite. And we did that for two years. Um, the Sun, at that time, Roberto Marino was getting quite old and feeble. And his son, Roberto De Neo, was not very interested in the idea of the satellite television, pay television. And so with that, we, uh, we uh, decided to leave it 
if he didn't want it, I didn't want to keep working there. And it was hard work in trying to establish it from nothing and trying to build stations around the country. So we left that in the fall of 1992, just in time for my daughter Olenka's marriage up in San Francisco area at the end of 1992. From that point on, Doreen and I have had a wonderful life. During the 1990s, starting in 1993, we started traveling all over the world. And that year we went to Europe, covered most of Europe. We went to China. In 1994, we went to Africa, safari in Africa, went all around Africa, South Africa, went to Brazil, got involved in some other little business type of thing in Brazil. And then we generally have had years of wonderful life and travel throughout, throughout our period in the 1990s. We settled back here in Bel Air, lived a great life there. Doreen had a home in Malibu, which we shared together. And then finally we moved into our present home in 2001. After living here, we've had a great life with our many friends and family and just a great, wonderful life. Outside, outside of the loss of my younger daughter uh, in 2009, we've had a great family life, wonderful children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, births, marriages, everything has been wonderful for us. And we are living a most happy life. If one is ready at the opportune time, things happen. That life takes its roads along. And if we're ready for them to happen, that's what happens. If the advice that I can give is to follow your dream, whatever it may be in life, and to get as much out of it as you feel you would like to have. And that changes as you move along each decade of your life you'll find that you will change. I learned a great deal about, um, about astronomy, certainly about our, our universe and about the, the uh, <clears throat> over a hundred billion stars in just our galaxy and about 200 billion galaxies so there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the earth. So it leads me to believe that there's a great deal that we don't know and so much to learn and to be aware of. And what we know is very little as compared to what really, really exists. I love life. I love living. I feel good. I have such a happy life with Doreen. She is wonderful. And what I have a desire to live, to enjoy my life just as it is. That's what I have. I take classes. I've been taking classes 
for 16 years at UCLA with students there. It's difficult to speak generally because different people have different things that they, that they find difficulty with in life. It depends, a lot of it depends, uh, as I said, things, it's like a ship that's moving along on the ocean. And every now and then, you'll pass a big rock, something in the way. You have to just steer the ship away from the rock. Sometimes things are difficult or not. And I think it, it's beyond, much of it is beyond our control. And I think luck is, is when this fortune strikes you and you're prepared for it. If you're not prepared for it, it won't happen. So that's what I don't, I, uh, luck to me is, is what I've mentioned. When, you, when you're ready for the opportunity that appears, you may not be ready for it, so you won't have it. So you won't have that luck. I, I do think a good part of our, of our nature is born. I think we come out of the factory a certain way. And in the main, in, in the main, that's the way we are. We can change some things. Some things we can change. But our nature within our spirit or our soul is there whether we're very shy or we're our personalities i believe much of it is we're born with colin is our daughter she is the love of our life both doreen and i she's the most wonderful dog we have had, she, she never barks, except if someone strange comes at the door. She's so good, so intuitive. She's our princess. She's our daughter. And we just hope she goes on and on with us. is living and keep moving. <laughs>